must happen. You know, we have a strange little, not a strange little word, but a word that is real special in prophecy. It's the word must. It's really a little three-letter Greek word, D-E-I, pronounced di. Comes from the prime of deal. And it means to bind. I mean, it is so bound that there's nothing you can do about it. And when God uses this word connected with prophecy through the Son in the New Testament, it's going to happen. It must happen. It's bound. There, you know, many times where the word must is utilized by man in God's word, it's conditional, meaning it, it may mean this or that pertaining to how a person reacts, decides, and behaves. But when God says it, concerning prophecy, if he says this is going to happen, it is bound. It's bound. There's nothing can prevent it. It's going as he has stipulated. That's what gives us strength in the word when you're able to ascertain what he means when he says it and, when he, and he does mean what he says. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 22. Let's find one of those cases in past history where he utilizes this word, and you know how it came to pass. It was bound, and man could do nothing about it. It was going to happen exactly as it was written. Luke chapter 22, the message being what must happen. Verse 1. Now, the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Not Easter, not Ishtar, but Passover, where Satan must pass over your home. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. That's to say Messiah. For they feared the people. In other words, they were afraid the people would come down on them if they destroyed Christ because they loved Christ. Verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. I mean, one of that God had picked right downtown, for a purpose. And Satan, he allowed Satan to enter. He listened to him. You know, he, he's going to whisper to God's elect. And you have to know and understand when that comes to pass and prevent it. Verse 4, And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. Verse 5, and they were glad and coveted to give him money. And naturally, it would be that 30 pieces of silver that is prophesied in the Old Testament that would be given for the price. It was the price of a slave. And that was the price paid for Christ, which ultimately would buy the potter's field, which they buried poor people. But it holds true today that that broken pottery, those old pots that they threw out there, only Christ, when your life gets that broken, can put it back together. Only he can do that. And that's the price that was paid to symbolize that um, uh, having happened. Verse 5, uh, verse 6, rather. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. That's to say, when the people are away and couldn't get riled up, I'll betray him to you. Verse 7. Listen carefully. This is why we came here. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must, not maybe, not perhaps, dia, bound, bind, be killed. Well, who was the Passover for this particular year? It was Christ himself. He was the lamb. He was the lamb slain that you have repentance today, that your sins can be washed away. But it was declared right there, it must, as written, must come to pass. And on, even according to the, the outlay of Daniel down to that day. Verse 8, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Now, understand this, when something is binding, it's always provided for. 
That's why Christ can know it's going to come to pass exactly as it's written. He said, you, you go get the place. Well, here, here they're, in, they're in town. What, what, what do you mean? And um, verse 9, And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? Well, what are we going to do? It is all right for you to ask the Father what he intends, even after he says must. It's okay. But at the same time, you want to listen to his answer, 10. And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water, follow him into the house where he entereth in. Now, how could Christ know that as they entered the city, presto magic, there's a man carrying a pitcher. You know, there, there could be a hundred of them. Uh-uh. Because this word pitcher means a clay pot. Men did not carry clay pots. Women carried play, clay pots. Men carried wineskins or a bottle made from skin. So it would be very unusual to see a man carrying a clay pot of water. A sign, prearranged, set in motion. Why? Because it must, dia, deal, binding, it must come to pass in that way. 11. And you shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. This is the last supper before the day of Passover meal. You've seen many drawings of the twelve sitting at the long table. And so it is, this was, in other words, it was keyed right down to every clue. Meaning what? Pre-arranged. Verse 12, And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And, and so it was. I use that to show you. Why, well, what must what? Well, you know that what happened. The Passover was killed, and it happened to be Christ crucified on the cross. And it did come to pass exactly it was as written. It was all laid out. Why? Because God loves you. That in this, your sins can be washed away. And Satan can be destroyed the one that triggered it, as it is written in, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Christ came to this earth to die on the cross, whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. Get him off your back. Who's going to do that for you? He is. Prearranged. When that word he is used, it's going to come to pass, especially when it pertains to, I'm, I'm going to repeat again, not man using it. But when Christ uses it, when our Father uses it in prophecy, it is a benchmark. It is going to happen. All right, now turn with me to the 15th chapter of this same book, Luke. And um, in Luke... 15, let's turn into, let's come up with, you'll all remember the prodigal son. Okay. Who, who was this prodigal son? You see, any parable Christ uses has a more in-depth meaning. The prodigal son is the people that went astray even in the first earth age. They fail to make the great. And the only thing that will bring them to it in this earth age is to accept the Savior, Christ. Now, the son that stays in the field working is God's elect, who were chosen in the first earth age, that still worked in the first earth age. And what we have here is this prodigal son, he was getting a little antsy, he said, I want my liquidity and I want to go away from home. Now, this means his inheritance of earth, that's to say soil and family, did not apply. This is just liquidity, his money in the bank. He took it, and you know what? He went down out into the world today, and he found all kinds of friends as long as his money lasted. 
I mean, he was popular because he was buying his way. When his money ran out, they wouldn't have anything to do with him. He had to feed hogs, the most unclean animal there is, to even gain anything, and that was some old carrot pods. But he had to eat the same thing the hogs was eating in this world today. Finally, the light shines up here somewhere in his gray matter. And he says, you know what? Back home, even the servants eat better than this. They don't eat hog slop. They eat good food. I'm going to go back to my father and just be a servant. And that is the attitude that one must have when they come to salvation. So we're going to pick it up in the 21st verse where... This one in this earth age, please bear in mind the earth ages or you're not going to understand the full depth of the, of the parable. Verse 21, and the son said unto him, this is when he finally gets home, said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. He just, he blew it. And this is a very humble thing. That's fine. This is a man coming to salvation or a woman coming to salvation, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, accepting our Heavenly Father. You understand? Away from the ways of, the, of this world, aged, especially today. But the Father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. That ring is a signet. That's what you signed checks with back then. 23. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. Do you know that every time a sinner converts and lets the Father know they love him, they're celebrated in heaven? That's what this is talking about. They really, even the angels shout with joy. That's scriptural. Verse 24, for this my son was dead. That means mortal. He was liable to die. And is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And so it is the conversion of bringing people. That's what the duty of the election is, is to help God bring his children into the fold, to help bring the sheep home to help them see the truth, that get involved in this world age and become a part of it, and then to realize how blessed the Father is. Verse 25. Now, this is what you have to be careful of as one of God's elect. This is just kind of the way things happen. Now, his elder son was in the field. Now, this field symbolizes the world, and he, he stayed in it working. That's what you're supposed to do. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Whoa, I'm not invited. I've been out there working. They're celebrating what's going on, 26. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant, 27. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, after thy, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. He's converted. He's received him, 28, and he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. He, he just sat down out under a tree and just stayed there. I mean, he, here, here, I've been out here working, busting my back or something, and nobody has ever killed this fatted calf for me. I've just been serving the father, just working at it generation after generation, and earth age, hear me, earth age after earth age. And I just have to keep working. And, um, and, and he just, he would not go in. Verse uh, 28, and he, he was angry. Okay, then 29. 28, let's read it again. And he was 28 reads, and he was angry and would not go in, therefore came his father out and entreated him. He's going to talk to him. Father can always reason with one of his elect, and they're going to accept it. They're going to understand it. 
29, and he answered and he said to his father, Lo, these many years I served thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. You, you didn't do that for me. Verse 30, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. He took his liquidity, he went out and blew it. And you're celebrating it? Verse 31, and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me from the first earth age, the second earth age, and the one coming. And all that I have is thine. This goes with Ezekiel chapter 44, where there is no allotment given God's election to Zadok. What do they inherit? God himself, everything. So this is what the elect must open their minds broad enough to understand. God is dealing not with his election, but with the lost in this world, and it must be done. You'll find it in the next verse, verse 32. It was meat. I'm going to give you one guess what this word meat is in the Greek. It's dia, die. It means it's bound. It's the same word as must. It, it, it is bound that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. That's what God expects of his election, is to help straighten. I know this old world is crooked, and sometimes you think they're not worth saving. They're God's children. He has sheep of that fold, and we have to think about them. You know, if we were just sent here to help save good people, really, that wouldn't be much doing, would it? You know? Good people are supposed to help, to join in, and to save God's children, which he loves, that are disillusioned, have been lied to, have been lied to, yes, even by churches and preachers. So they don't know. But you have God's word, and God's elect have eyes to see and ears to hear. You want something to be thankful for on Thanksgiving? That's it. It's to know and understand. Nobody can take that away from you. It's yours. You're in the field working, working toward accomplishing our Father's overall plan. It is meat, dia. It is bound as you are bound. There's nothing you could do to break away from it within your own heart when you follow your spirit. You would not wish to break away from it because it is serving the living God and ultimately, what is it when you inherit everything? That's the first fruit, which in, in, um, which in that 31st verse documents that we are talking about God's elect. Okay, It can be no one else. They have that double inheritance. Now, if you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. <clears throat> Let's pick it up, if we may, in verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, this is John chapter 10, verse 7. I say unto you, I am, that's the sacred name, I am that I am, I am the door of the sheep. Do you know something? There is no other gate. There's no other door. I know that offends some people, be that as it may. Verse 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. In other words, God's election, his own sheep, they, they don't listen to malarkey. They don't listen to false teaching. They don't listen to the false Christ. They listen to the true Christ. They hear the word of God. 
They follow the Word of God. It is so important. You know, many people have known they had a destiny since they were a child. They knew there was more to God's Word. And certainly if you're one of God's elect, it's true, you have a destiny and a purpose. And it is strong. Verse 9, I am the door, and by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Do you know what pasture is? That's food, spiritual food. In other words, you can go in and out of the Word of God, and you're going to find deeper truths and more complete truths as long as you work at it. This letter that God has sent to you telling you how to have a happier life, how to be happy in flesh bodies. Pasture. That's what a pastor is for, is providing pasture to the sheep. Food. Feed them, they will come. Verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. Why? Because he serves the destroyer. I am come that they might have life, eternal life and that they might have it more abundantly. That means forever and ever. And, and what does it mean abundantly? Why be unhappy today when you're a child of God? Do you understand that? You are a child of the living God, He that created all things. That, that is really awesome. And the main thing is, He loves you. He may not love what you do all the time, but he does love you. And that's why you want to listen to him and not the false one. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And so he did as he was on that Passover. It must come to pass that the Passover be killed, the lamb. He was it. He did not shirk his, his, the way, 12. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and that's the Antichrist, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. They're going to hop in the sack with the Antichrist. They're going to think it is Christ because of what they teach. They haven't taught, as simple as, as Mark 13 is, in Matthew 24, they do not teach it that the Antichrist must come first before we gather back to Christ. So naturally, when the Antichrist comes, who do they think it is? Christ. That's what Antichrist in the Greek tongue means, instead of Christ. I mean, in the place of Jesus, pretending to be Jesus. Verse 13. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. He's in it for the money. Okay. That's what they hire out to do. 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. He knows the election. Why? He chose them in the first earth age. And am no one of mine. Mine know me. There's no guesswork. There's nothing in between. 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He, he was crucified for you. That you, know, you know, remember all your sins? You'd still have them if it wasn't for him. And on confessing them to him and asking forgiveness, they're washed away. He paid that price for you. You cannot help but love him. <clears throat> 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must, dia, bound. It's triggered. It's going to happen. Man has nothing to do with it. Must bring, and they shall hear my voice and shall be one fold and one shepherd. Christ, shepherd of all, Lord of lords, king of kings. And so it is that those that believe upon him. But this must come to pass. You see, the election have a lot more to do. As the elder son did in the field, he had to keep working because there's work to do. There's so many lost souls in this world that are being misled, lied to. And that truth needs to go forward. 
that when you have that person coming to you and asking what in the world is happening, you can tell them what must happen, happens. That's reassuring. And it gives a foundation on which no other can build when you follow the shepherd. Verse 17. Therefore doth my father love me. That's the reason he loves me. Because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He, he knew he could. Why? Well, next verse documents it. No man taketh it from me, but I, Satan didn't take it from him. The Kenites didn't take it from him. He lay, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father, and so it is that serving him, loving him, that these things must, not maybe, not perhaps, you can write it in the book. It is written, and it shall come to pass exactly as it is written. Now, go with me, and the reason we've made this study, to Matthew chapter 24. That's in the New Testament. It's the 24th chapter of the first book of the New Testament. I'm not being condescending, I'm teasing, okay? <laughs> Matthew chapter 24, pick it up with verse 3. Let's understand what subject we want to discuss here. Verse 3 reads, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, he's pulled out of Jerusalem, and he's sitting back over on the mount right across the little valley of Kedron. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be questioned? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? That's the second advent. And of the end of the world, question. Do you know that's a question that everyone wonders. When is the end going to be? Do you want to read about it? That's what he sent you the letter for. He not only tells you all the seven seals, seven trumps, and seven vials in this 24th chapter, of the whole book of Revelation, as they must come to pass. But he also gives you clues that you need to recognize in what's going on around you. Verse 4, And Jesus answered, and he said unto them, Take heed, that no man deceive you. You see, deception, you want to check this man or any man or woman out that claims to teach God's Word, you want to check them out, what? In the Word of God, whether it be of truth or not. Okay. Because there are many deceivers in this world. Next verse, verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. A lot of Christian preachers say, well, Christ sent me, I'm an ordained minister of God's Word. I never get around to teaching God's Word, but I do like to just get up here and talk to you all about Aunt Nellie and what happened to her down at the windmill, you know, and on and on, but never quite getting into God's Word, what God has to say. Be careful, my friend. There are many deceivers. One of the favorite things a deceiver will tell you, you don't have to worry about the book of Revelation. I mean, you're going to be gone. You're going you're gonna to rapture out of here like a big bird. You don't have... Now, God told you to learn it. Would you listen to a man that would tell you, you don't have to understand it? Just listen to him? Uh, you making him a god? You want to be real careful. It's easy to be deceived in this final generation. Because you've got some high-powered super preachers out there. Do they teach God's Word? That's the point. But now, back to the subject. When is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And when is the end going to be? Six. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must, there's our word, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Well, goodness gracious, let's think a moment. Here we got. 
wars and numerous wars all the way around the world. We got men on two different nations now, and we got security troops in Europe and all around, and just the, the rumors of this one's going to get the atomic weapon and that one, and we just the end's not yet. So sleep good tonight. Okay, must. In other words, it's bound. It's secure. It's going to happen the way he says. Not the way some man might say or someone else. Must. It is bound. It is tightly bound. Man cannot alter it. There is nothing conditional about it. It's a fact. And it will come to pass as it is written. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Who are they picking up? Okay. Well, well, what are these then? Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Do you know what sorrows are? Those are in the Greek, that's labor pains. In other words, it's the first pain. What, what happens when a lady... That just using a natural birth, that's what this wants you to do. When the labor pains start, what does that mean? You better get ready. Okay. There's going to be the birth of a new age. That's what we're talking about here. So what do you see today? That's why I wanted to bring this to you today when you look around you. There's wars and rumors of wars, one nation taking over another nation, you might say, well, I, I just thought they were getting free. Freed by who? Satan? Who? You know, it hasn't been said yet, but if you're really sharp, you have eyes to see, you know what's going on. Okay? And it's happening. The swarmers are about to turn into devourers. And you're living in it. These are the labor pains that must not maybe, not perhaps, must come to pass exactly as it is written. These are the beginning. Now, as I told you, that particular chapter continues on then, and it goes into many things. Uh, primarily, it goes into um, the seven seals, which you're supposed to have locked in your mind. What, what was that first seal? Let me see. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Well, it's on a white horse. It looks like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's come. There's just one problem, if you understand the manuscript. The bow that's supposed to be the aurora, the glow, the Shekinah glory, that's supposed to be around him, is toxon. It's a cheap fabric imitation. Because it's not Christ, it's the Antichrist. That's the first seal. That's the first thing you're supposed to have in your mind placed there whereby you're not deceived in these end times. It's so simple. And what is the second? Third goes into the four horsemen of war and rumors of war and famine. The same things we read. You're supposed to have those locked into your mind. And when they are locked into your mind, then you know they must come to pass, not as man has said they would, but as Christ, as Christ has said they would. Turn with me to the very first chapter of the great book of Revelation. That's the last book in the Bible. We could go a long, long way with this, but this will be the last scripture I will read in this particular setting, and we'll discuss it a little bit. The Revelation, who was it given to? It was given to John. St. John, whom Christ so loved that he would even send him home with his own mother while he was being crucified. He loved him that much, trusted him that much. And then he would have him not only write the great book St. John, where in chapter 8 he tells who the Kenites are, who their father is, lays it right out on the line. But then he also lets him write the three little epistles of John, which come one book from this great book of Revelation, telling you 
in chapter, uh, first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 18, if my memory's working right, and it usually does, the Antichrist is coming. He's coming first. It's the end time. Are you ready for it? And then he continues on and gives him the revelation. Do you understand what he did? He took John to the Lord's Day. Do you know what the Lord's Day is? What is one day with the Lord? It says a thousand years with man. Second Peter chapter 3, verse uh, seven, 6 or 7. It's the millennium. He took John to the first day of the millennium and let him see what would happen to us just before the millennium, where we're at now, on the first day of the millennium, and what would be after. So you wouldn't be deceived, so that you have the truth. So what, what does the very first verse in, of this great book that John was given, naturally it's God speaking, listen to it. Chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, that's the anointed one, which God gave unto him. Where did it come from? The full Godhead. To show, to do what? To show unto his servants. I don't know, are you a servant of the living God? This is what it's about. Things which must, not perhaps, dear, absolutely it is bound, it is locked. It's going to come to pass that way, shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And so it was. We could take this a lot further, and we will as we continue on through this coming year into what this leads, the tentacles that this leads into, the truth in God's word that is bound and that man must absorb. You know, how our Father loves those that stay in the field working. You can get real jealous if you're not careful. You know, one of the biggest mistakes people make is, well, do you see how he's blessing those people? They're a bunch of crooks. Okay. Look at them. Okay. But to be honest in God's work and to be bringing forth, not ripping off widows and old folks, not promising people salvation and they can buy their way into heaven. It's free. Free for the taking. The message that God intended us to deliver in the simplicity in which Christ gave it to us. You know, the people are hungry for pasture. That's good, solid food. They, you know... People will go where God tells them to, but they must know it is from him that leads. You get that from the word of God. You must follow his instructions, not the instructions of man. For what he has said in prophecy, it is not conditional as men use this same word. Men weaken things, you know. There'll be a condition there. This will must happen if... That big word, if, well, you can discount. God didn't say that. He put it as a condition to man. But prophecy that he ties this jia to will come to pass. You can count on it. You can count on the word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, for the direction that you give us, Father. We, give, we thank you for these, this letter that you have sent us setting aside and marking those places in your word that we know are bound and are going to come to pass exactly as you stated they would as we see this troubled world today, to let us see the light, Father, that is coming, the approach of the true Messiah, not the fake. Father, protect the sheep that hear your voice. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mark of the beast.